Um, I have to present the next speaker, um, Martin Orbo. I have to present just, and afterwards you have to not you you uh, so, so stand up, wonderful, and you will speak from here, so that everybody can see you when I make the description, in order to know better whether it's right or wrong. Uh, Martin uh, is uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Wales and Principal Research Associate at the London School of Economics, <coughs> Professor in Beijing and so forth. Martin is, Albro, is an eminent and one of the first globalization theorists and one of the most renowned English language experts on Max Weber's writings. He studied history and sociology at the London School of Economics as well at the University of Cambridge where he obtained his doctorate degree uh, some years ago before accepting a position as professor for sociological theory at the University of Wales also some years ago. Since um, 1880s has held many guest professorships and fellowships in Europe and the United States including and I don't make the list because the list is rather known to everybody. His book The Global Age was awarded the University of Rome's European Amalfi Prize for Sociology and Social Sciences. It is, has been translated into German twice. Uh, first with, with a rather curious and interesting translation as Das Ende des Nationalstaats and you see what German translation art is possible to do and meanwhile it has been changed a little bit but it is great to have this important book for our discussion in our mind. Uh, since October 2012 Martin Orbo is fellow at the Kater Hamburger Center for Advanced Study Law as Culture where he is conducting research on the topic of globalization, multiculturalism and principles of global governance and a lot of other things and themes. So thank you very much <laughs> that you took over this difficult and important task to make the opening speech for us. Thank you so much, Martin. Is that all right? Can you hear? Yeah. Ich bedanke mich sehr für den Privileg, also einen Vortrag hier zu geben, uh, insbesondere an den Katie Hamburger, uh, Kolleg und mein Kolleg, uh, uh, Mitarbeiter Werner Gebhardt. Das, das gibt mir große Freude hier uh, zu sprechen. Aber uh, das ist auch ein Privileg, mein meine eigene Sprache zu gebrauchen. Ich meine, äh, das wäre lästig, wenn ich auf Deutsch einen Vortrag gebe heutzutage. Das habe ich damals gemacht, aber jetzt nicht mehr. Das, das vergeht auf die Jahre hin. Ja. Zurück. Ja, jetzt muss ich Englisch sprechen. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I want to talk about responsibility because it's a very old-fashioned concept. And while I have uh, taken the view that we need new concepts for a global age, it's also the case we need to retain the old concepts, or at least the old ones which still mean something. And the idea of responsibility is prevalent uh, in our world today. It's employed by every national leader. It's employed in all kinds of contexts. When Max Weber formulated his notions of ethics, Gesinnungsethik und Verantwortungsethik, die Verantwortungsethik was for the politician. It was for the leaders to be responsible for the consequences of their acts. And to this day, we have responsibility invoked. Uh, I have a slide here I would like to show. Is this the best one? No, it's not. No. I need... I need that one, yes. Thank you very much. This is a speech by your uh, highly respected Chancellor Angela Merkel. Uh, I, I will translate it out into English so that you don't think that I'm misunderstanding the German, but correct my English, please. 
uh, I commit myself explicitly to the co-responsibility of politics for a community consciousness based on norms, ideas and attitudes. Ethical striving is a question of survival for the modern state. It is not for nothing that the preamble of our basic law begins in the consciousness of its responsibility before God and humanity. That's a very profound way to begin. She's not alone, of course. I could present, and I have in other contexts, series of quotations of politicians invoking responsibility. Barack Obama is one who does it very frequently. Only nine days ago, after the Boston Marathon massacre, he announced, any responsible individual, any responsible group will feel the full weight of justice. Now, in this case, as opposed to the positive sense of responsibility, he's pointing a finger of blame, responsibility for good or for evil. In the words of the liberal thinker Friedrich Hayek, who more than any other wanted to draw a line under the collectivism of the interwar era, Responsibility, not to a superior, but to one's own conscience, is the very essence of any morals that deserve the name. End of quote. Unlike other human qualities such as intelligence, consciousness, happiness, responsibility involves choice and therefore is a proper subject for ethical consideration. But then, what is the responsibility of the group to which Obama refers? As a trained lawyer, he's fully aware of the complexity of imputing responsibility to persons or groups. And he's fully aware that it's a central issue in legal considerations. These aspects of responsibility then, the ethical and the social, these and the way they're bonded into the law, this is the first of two themes which make up the substance of my remarks today. The other theme is globality and the way it requires us to rethink the conclusions which Hayek drew about collectivism and to consider again its place in human affairs. To an extent, irrespective of the topical illusions I've just made, a concern for responsibility might appear to be universalistic and abstract, more appropriate for a philosopher than for a humble sociologist like myself. But Hayek's concerns were indeed for the proper social arrangements in which responsibility could be located. And he expressed the belief that it was in this small organization that responsibility could best be lodged, the small divisions. Now, like Hayek, I want to scale responsibility. I want to bring it down to Earth, or at least to the globe, which is the rough shape of the Earth, and which I suppose is a scaling up rather than scaling down. So let me begin with remarks about globality. An equally abstract concept to be sure, but one that should never allow us to escape the material conditions of the planet. Hayek wrote in 1944, those conditions, conditions of the world in which we live and of the planet, they've been transformed since then. And it must be appropriate to revisit the fundamental issues that he raised. We have not followed the road to serfdom that he warned us not to take, but we are in another place of some confusion. For those who've got used to the word globalization, and it took a long time, 
Globality might seem to be a neologism too far. But they should recall, in the 1950s and 60s, global took some time to catch hold. It's quite a long time, and it took a long time. Carl Schmitt observed how the circumnavigation of the globe first brought the division of its surface into the imagination of merchants, uh, rulers, and lawyers. But it was only in 1950 that he expressed that as global linear thinking. Global linear thinking. One of the very first uses of global in this way. It was in the immediate post-war period that global became then a common term, rendering a meaning distinct from universal, international, or ecumenical. In the churches, they used global to distinguish it from ecumenical. It was a very useful uh, terminological invention then. As opposed to those ideas, global had a spatial reference, and that enabled Marshall McLuhan to coin the phrase, the global village, the metaphor of our lived community beyond local con connection, and for René Dubot to point to the global and the local defining each other in the slogan, think globally, act locally. And the result was globalization, globalism, globality in nearly every European language. I think only the French really stood out, didn't they, by distinguishing mondialization and, and globalization. It's a very important distinction, very useful. When the sociologist Roland Robertson wrote the first book-length treatment of globalization, he also then uh, proliferated uh, global uh, neologisms, globality was one that he promoted, global culture, and globalization, which has never fully captured, uh, caught on, and he, in fact, borrowed that from the Japanese. When a little later I went on to publish The Global Age, it was in full recognition of this wider shift of discourse. Th that book didn't invent the term Global Age. There were occasional previous uses, but it was an attempt to express what is involved in that notion about the time in which we live. In my view, I'm simply referring to what is generally part of our discourse. It's a collective reference, and certainly publishers and authors ever since have found it extremely useful to frame their book as such and such in the global age, Europe in the global age, etc., etc. And since that time, we've talked about global governance, global civil society, global elites. I don't call it age of globalization, and the reason is because, of course, globalization was captured by the neoliberals and became an ideological watchword. Um, I prefer the global age rather than the age of globalization precisely because, to me, it reflects that shock which distinguishes the time in which we live from the old modern age, as I prefer to call it. Call it. The old modern age was the age of a belief in progress, the advance of civilization, the control of society through science. Its inspiration goes back to statements like those by Francis Bacon, the advancement of science, science, civilization, progress, all watchwords of the old modern age. There was a shock, and the shock came in my lifetime. And I still vividly remember those images of the explosions at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it was a shock which was reflected by the major philosophers of the time, by Karl Jaspers, for instance, and by Arnold Toynbee. They all recognized we have moved on. Initially, Toynbee talked of the postmodern age. He is the first person to promote the notion of a postmodern age in a very prominent manner.
Others have called it then post-modernity, after Arnold Toynbee. He also spoke of the atomic age. But when you speak of the postmodern age, you refer really to confusion. And to that extent, I think they're right. Orientation to the globe, what does that mean? We can go round the globe in circles and meet each other coming back. We can bump into each other going in opposite directions. We can globalize markets, sure. But we can globalize regulation too. Globalization takes us nowhere. Other things have to give us direction. Now, neoliberals have persuaded those of the left and of the right that globalization means unfettered markets. That's the ideological success of hegemonic intellectuals. It's not an analytical necessity. We don't have to believe that globalization simply means free markets and dropping state boundaries. As I say, that's an ideological triumph led by Bill Clinton. And to a smaller extent, Tony Blair and a smaller extent, Tony Giddens. <laughs> well, our conference reflects in its opening statement, globality seems to permeate all cultures and social spheres today. And in the lectures which follow, we will find displayed the vast scope that the examination of globality can assume from the media to democracy through human rights, religion, theater, up to and including global, global ethics. Werner, thank you. You have already introduced us to this vast, rich range of topics that we're going to consider in the next two days. But all this is done without reference to the national. And since Hayek associated collectivism with nationalism, it could appear his ideas have triumphed and in a way he didn't imagine. For along with a widely acknowledged advance of individualism, of which he would have approved, we have, as it were, at the opposite end of the social spectrum, a globality beyond national boundaries, which when viewed through its lens, we detect global problems extending far beyond our personal capacities. How can an individual person address resource depletion, overpopulation, environmental degradation, species lost, climate change, nuclear security, energy security, global poverty, epidemics, terrorism, international migration, crimes against humanity, human rights, and, and, and the crises of global capitalism? How can we as individuals deal with those issues? Do we not have to call upon what appropriately are termed agencies, collective ones, even the most powerful ever yet developed, the state. Have we not to, to address the place of collective agency in the global age as well as individualism? Indeed, when we consider responsibility in the frame of globality, it may be our leaders invoke it so often because the number and scale of the issues which face them are so great that what is in their power seems heartbreakingly inadequate. These calls to responsibility sound like those calls to courage and patriotism which led millions to sacrifice their lives in vain as they ran forward over the trenches to bring each other to their deaths in the two world wars. To call for responsibility in Hayek's sense of following conscience is paradoxical in this context. It can, after all, provoke pacifism as much as patriotism. The calls for responsibility then represent an appeal to commitment. Does that mean follow a leader as much as to follow conscience? But that is the collectivism which Hayek abhorred. The conclusion we have to draw is surely that with the idea of responsibility, we must address both individual conscience and the collective conscience. If we look at responsibility in 
an analytical way, in a sociological way, a philosophical way. This may provide us with some route out of this confusion which the globality of our time has brought us. And it may force us to recognize the new bonds of society into which we're tied. Which is why the Bishop of London recently, in his funeral address for Hayek's greatest admirer, Margaret Thatcher, was at pains to say that her famous statement, there's no such thing as society, had been misunderstood. She only wanted to dismiss the idea of an impersonal entity, I quote from the Bishop, she wanted to dismiss the idea of an impersonal entity to which we are tempted to surrender our independence. This is the book that Margaret Thatcher, by reputation, carried in her handbag. And when she was in dispute with her colleagues, she would pull it out and say, read this. Yeah. So it is really a very important book for our time, 1944 part has been very, very influential, and it's still influential. I, did a, um, I, I wrote a paper on the notion of the big society that was published recently, and I've just read a paper which refers back to that, and the whole paper is a commentary on Hayek. I'm not sure whether it's because I understood Hayek or misunderstood. Uh, sorry, that's your property? Uh, no, uh, it is Thatcher's. Uh, no, 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 no. No, it's not actually hers. No, no. 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 And he was a close friend. <laughs> so close to her, I never was. <laughs> yes, I wanted to. I never even met her. I never met her. <laughs> <laughs> mm. It's a deep irony, a deep irony of contemporary global and not just British society that the funeral of the iconic figure of neoliberal ideology should have taken place in St Paul's Cathedral in London. In the space before that cathedral, only a year before, the Occupy movement had attracted attention worldwide. It pitched its camps in front, its tents in front of the cathedral, and maybe some of you saw that on, on the global news which you get now. I'm delighted to say that Margaret Thatcher's funeral was covered as much in, in TV as it was in the UK. The Occupy camp in front of St Paul's was of course set up against the exploitation of the poor and the gross inequalities which exist in the world. And it divided the Church of St. Paul's. The dean of the cathedral, the dean had to resign because he supported the protesters. The church hierarchy eventually managed to eject them. But there we see, as it were, almost the epicenter. St. Paul's Cathedral in London, the epicenter of the global conflicts of our time. One moment, occupy. One moment, all those tents. And I walked through those tents and I talked to people there. And I I went into their library. One of the tents had a library, literally. Books all around, which you could take and bring back freely, of course, but also the connection to the internet so that you could make your calls through to San Francisco and to, and to Calcutta and so on. Occupy was a global, it's a global event. The anti-globalization movement or, as its more recent supporters have named it, the alter globalization movement represents the assumption of responsibility for realizing goals at a personal level. It's the answer of millions of supporters to the question of what role can individuals play in responding to this array of global issues. It is the successor of social movements which have been mobilized worldwide ever since the Second World War, it's a se successor of the peace movement, you may recall it, uh, the women's movement, the green movement. These are still movements which move people. In the case of alter globalization, we're fortunate in having an outstanding empirical study of its adherence by a sociologist who has shown an equal amount of dedication in his research as his respondents to their cause. Over eight years, Jeffrey Players attended 250 activist meetings. He was 
He attended seven World Social Forums. He attended the anti-G8 and anti-World Trade Organization demonstrations between 2001 and 2009. This very talented young Belgian sociologist, uh, his book has come out in this last year. It's called Alter Globalization, Becoming Actors in the Global Age. Uh, notice the Global Age reference is no accident, frankly. It's got as its main theme the interplay of self-definition and reasoned engagement with global issues in opposition to the dominant players on the global stage. In that process, there is a continual formation and reformation of collectivity and exploration of organizational form. Protest camps may appear to the passing journalist as an ongoing party to the sounds of the samba, but intensive organizing is going on simultaneously over the internet, into the night, internationally. In Geoffrey Player's words, the individual lived experience intersects with collective history. And as opposed to revolutionaries in previous eras, quote, these activists consider social transformation to be an ongoing collective process. As Hayek would have wanted, in general, they're suspicious of large organization. They prefer to replicate small groups rather than produce large organizations with representative structures. They are bottom, a bottom-up response to the dominant collectivities of our time, nation states and global corporations. Now, the activists may disdain official channels. Yet the language of state and citizenship is also employed by others committed to goals beyond the nations, beyond the nation state. In the idea of citizenship, there's always been a recognition of responsibility beyond any special duties in employment. It is held to be a moral requirement of those belonging to a political community to participate responsibly in its institutions in return for enjoying the protection and entitlements they provide. Extended to the global, for many, the corollary of human rights is a duty to act as a global citizen. That in turn may involve lobbying government to act in the global interest to ensure that they think globally and not just nationally. The prime example in our time is of course popular pressure to commit governments to the reduction of carbon emissions in the atmosphere, a global issue which until the global financial crisis dominated all others. But the agencies of the contemporary nation state don't have to be prodded by popular pressure to adopt policies on global issues. They are locked into an immense intricate web of obligations to which they are committed, either as members of the uh, um, United Nations or by adhering to multilateral agreements. In the names of their citizens, they sign up to the Millennium Development Goals, they establish an international criminal court, or they affirm they have a responsibility to protect. Responsibility goes up to the apex of the international system. So I've alluded to many kinds of responsibility so far. Responsibility to people or in my office. Responsibility for people or to my conscience. Shared responsibility, collective responsibility. They're all variations around the term. I mean, in English we're limited by this one term, uh, responsibility. In German at least you can distinguish Verantwortung in a task or a deed and Verantwortlichkeit as an attitude or an ethos. I think a nice distinction we can't draw in English without further explanation. <coughs> wow. 
I now want to do a little, it's a slightly technical area I go into, and this is the idea of responsibility as it has been uh, examined by lawyers and sociologists. And I take two main instances. There are two, I think, there is one particular classic in the study of responsibility by the French uh, disciple of the uh, Durkheimian school, Paul Fauconnet. Over 80 years ago, Fauconnet, as sociologists here will expect, came to the conclusion that responsibility is a social fact. Um, and he made that declaration on the basis of a theoretical analysis of what is involved in declaring someone is responsible for something. He says there is obviously a rule out there in society. The rule is um, that, uh, that, that X should bear responsibility. And that theory of responsibility presupposes a theory of sanctions. So responsibility is applied in the penal law. And the penal law determines who can be held responsible. You can't hold children responsible, the insane, corpses, animals, inanimate objects. They're not held responsible. Not at any rate in contemporary societies. Although, of course, Fauconet looks at examples where in the past, in other societies, corpses, for instance, have been held responsible, or animals. The focus of Fauconet was picked up later by a South African anthropologist, Max Gluckman. In a volume entitled The Allocation of Responsibility, which is a comparative study of responsibility in uh, differing uh, pre-literate societies. And in a sense it bears out Fauconet's uh, uh, assumption that responsibility is a widely dispersed notion, it's held socially, it's applied, it's applied, and the word for that application that Buckman chooses is allocation. Now, as Fauconet points out, French doesn't handle that concept very well. English doesn't hold, doesn't tackle it very well. German does. Von Liszt's Lehrbuch. And I, I put this in English now. In purely formal terms, Zurechnungsfähigkeit can be defined as the capacity of action to be punished by law. That is, actions which have the capacity to incur relevant legal sanctions that follow on from their punishable illegality. If that seems rather wordy, I just have to refer you to the original in German. It's Liszt's Lehrbuch. Now, there's a slight oddity in Fauconet referring back to Zurechnungsfähigkeit because it doesn't quite fit his rule. His rule was, for all responsibility, X is responsible where X is a person. But in fact, Liszt's definition of Zurechnungsfähigkeit refers to the action and not to the person. Now, that's the starting point for a, a a very thorough study of the notion of causation in law by two Oxford philosophers, eminent philosophers and legal theorists, H.L.A. Uh, Hart and A.M. Honore. In a book published in 1959. As you might expect from British jurists, they say, in the beginning, Common sense allows us to, in practice, identify causes of events and the part that people play in them. And they caution us against accepting textbook writers' uh, accounts of how difficult it is to establish causes. It's the finding of the principles behind the attribution of the causes, which is the problem. It's easy to find the causes, but what about the principles? Now, from Hart and Honore's point of view, that's the problem that the 
German legal culture gets tied up in. And they compare the vast number of books in German legal theory on causation and motivation compared with the complete absence in the British common law. They say attribution of blame for an act requir requiring punishment is a very restricted notion of responsibility and in fact it's a special case of the general Aristotelian rule that you, you attribute free voluntary acts to free individuals. So it's really the fundamental definition of the human agent which underlies all of this. And it follows from this account that law can be included within the wider discourse of a society in identifying causes and attributing agency to individuals. And in this case, they say, with Zurechnung, we have a curious strand in German philosophical thought, which goes back to Kant's sharp distinction between Zurechnung and causation and the identification of causes with physical processes. And Hart and Honore object that if you can't consider voluntary conduct as causal, you've got a great deal of difficulty in dealing with, let's say, the difference between self-administered poison and poison unwittingly swallowed, which someone's put in your place. The, the question of the voluntariness of it is crucial in, in, in attributing in, uh, causation. So they clearly regard, as you might expect the British lawyer to regard, common sense to be superior to theory. And that reminds me of a joke among lawyers told me by my very old friend who's sitting here in front, distinguished lawyer himself, Dr. Hugh Cannon. Um, the English judge reflecting as an English judge has to do before he makes his judgment and saying, the common law is common sense. And overhearing which one lawyer in the courtroom says to another, get ready for an absurd verdict. <coughs> we can jump to conclusions too quickly about cultural differences on law. Um, After all, German criminal law in the 19th century drew very effectively on John Stuart Mill, who was, after all, not German. Um, nonetheless, Hart and Honore conclude, it is impossible to suppress the promptings of common sense. That's the last sentence of that book. It's a statement about English common law versus continental law. And this is where I think this is where we need to be searching for the cultural differences, not in the sort of variations on the treatment of murder, of capital punishment, etc., between countries, or the age of, uh, of majority, or any of these issues. Obviously, they differ from legal system to legal system. We need to go deeper. We need to go uh, deeper into how societies and cultures interpret action in general. We have to go to the fundamental concepts. The comparison of common law and continental law brings into consideration the methods of reasoning about responsibility, the concept of the human agent, and relations between individual and society. The idea of responsibility is then lodged in a set of universal, existential, and ontological concepts known through human experience, self and other, knowledge, action, causation, chance, surrounding environment, individual, identity, and group, those ideas will vary from culture to culture. Responsibility in the broadest sense of results that can be attributed to human action and in the narrower sense of acts which provoke retribution or reward from others and in the st still narrower sense of performing a prescribed duty, they belong to that set of fundamental concepts. Now, the shift to the global age involves such a change. 
in the parameters of human experience. Knowledge no longer delivers control of nature. It prepares for the eventualities it can't predict. Individuals and others define themselves in relation to the fate of the human species. The collectivity to which we all belong contains the seeds of its own destruction. The public sphere is sustained through global media. There are endless possibilities of collective self-organization. These are the features of our time, the deep features which led me to argue we live in a global age. <coughs> And those features don't mention the end of the nation state. They don't mention the loss of community or the rise of enemy or any of these other things. None of those things are intrinsic to this shift out of the modern age and into the global age. The transformation is more fundamental than any. It concerns the relations of individuals to collectivities, of norms to people and to interaction on a global scale. Now, I've got four examples now of, um, and I'm going to have to, where is the key that I had? Key, this is a kind of key. Do I use it? Is it this one? Oh, yes, right one, the right on, the, on the right, right side. Ah. For example. This is my first example of responsibility. You notice this is still in the old modern age. The Allied and Associated Governments affirm and Germany accepts the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the loss and damage to which the Allied and Associated Governments and their nationals have been subjected as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the aggression of Germany and her allies. Now, forget war guilt. Forget how contentious this was. The important thing I want to point to is the collective responsibility. And so when subsequently one complains about nationalism, look, the nationalism is embedded in that statement. Responsibility is attributed to a country and to its citizens by inference. <coughs> The clause, incidentally, was, was uh, drafted by John Foster Dulles. John Foster Dulles, arguably the most important architect of the 21st century. And I say that because he drafted that clause in the Treaty of Versailles. He was the leading drafter of the principles behind the United Nations and the Declaration of Human Rights. And he was the designer of the Cold War, if anybody else was. John Foster Dulles, remarkable figure, and suggests that individuals obviously can change events. They can direct history as well. Now, the second And here we come into the global age, the responsibility to protect. And this is, it comes out in different forms. It is widely argued in the United Nations at the moment. It's broadly accepted. It is the basis, for instance, of the uh, uh, British and French intervention in Libya. Uh, it's the basis of the French and, I think, German intervention in Mali. It's would be the basis, it would be the basis of any intervention in Syria, which is likely to come. But you should remember that when it is invoked, it is invoked by the agreement of the Security Council, including Russia and China. Russia and China supported the initial intervention in Libya, for instance. Or at least they didn't vote against it. The responsibility to protect, then, is one of the most dramatic advances in the notion of global collective responsibility that we've ever seen. That's the second of my examples. Now, the third I don't have an overhead for, because it may be because it would anger people here too much. This is corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility, CSR, often regarded as a fig leaf, which conceals the rape of the poor people of the world. 
It's a rubric widely used by the global corporation to express concern for wider responsibilities than their legal duties to shareholders. It's a normative commitment, a direct response to the agitation of civil society organizations and campaign groups. And it's pressure that works. CSR may be hypocrisy, but hypocrisy, if you remember Rochefort Go, is the homage which vice pays to virtue. Global corporations do monitor their supply chains. They do identify reputational risks. They do take steps to reduce them. So CSR is then a practical program for the majority of global corporations, especially those which have a daily contact with the consumer, of course. Collective responsibility is a widely acknowledged feature of our world today. How does that work if we accept the Weberian principle of reducing all collective agency to the actions and individuals of individuals? In brief, it is enforced by global public opinion. If one likes by the Durkheimian conscience collective, and it works through, in and through, the individual conscience. The problem is it operates unevenly and imperfectly. I mean, some of us don't mind buying fruit and vegetables which come from Chile or from across the other side of the world, and some of us do mind, and some of us would prefer to buy locally because we're worried about the carbon emissions and so on. These chains of reasoning are the interchange between the collective and the individual conscience. Because where do we get this idea of things from far away which come to us and which perhaps we ought not to be buying because of the carbon emissions that come through the flights and the transportation. Those are ideas communicated to us through the global media. I think there's been a backwardness in the academic assimilation of global responsibility and normativity. And it's a result, possibly, of an ongoing failure between French collectivism on the one hand and German individualism on the other. Uh, remember, Weber and Durkheim, they didn't want to talk to each other. They, they, they scrupulously ignored each other. Well, Weber ignored the French more than the French ignored the Germans. I think that's right, uh, Werner, yes. In principle, I think it's quite easy, the empirically, to survey the relative weight of commitment to the global or the national or the local or the community in, by survey methods. It's a very mundane way, and that very mundane way has been employed, uh, for instance, above all by uh, Ronald Inglehart in the World Value Surveys. And you ask people's questions quite simply. Uh, do you consider your prime obligation being to your local community? Or you might begin with your family, your family, your community, your nation, the globe. And we find from surveys of that kind, of course, that the globe is the least important thing. For most people, the family comes first. Well, that's fine. That's fine. But note, the globe is there as a factor in our decisions. So I want to affront all of the West's cherished self-images with a fourth high-profile example of collective responsibility. The Chinese rural responsibility system. And I'm quoting there from a, a standard work published in 1985. We must adhere to the principle of democratic management. As in the selection of the reform of the responsibility system, any improvement or revision should follow the mass line. The masses should be aroused to hold discussions and their wishes should be respected. The leadership should assist the masses in evaluating their experiences and seeking ways to improve the responsibility system. And we in the West we laugh, don't we? We look to each other and we smile and we say, <laughs> we know what that means. But we don't know what that means because our experience of this is in the West or in the Soviet Union or in East Germany or wherever. 
And it works differently in China. It works differently in China and we have now something like 30, nearly 35 years of experience of the fact that it works. And it works because the relationship between the responsibility that you owe to your family, to your community, to your collective, to your party, to the state, that is a very, very complex set of responsibilities of which people are entirely aware. The notion of responsibility pervades Chinese society. The Chinese economic miracle began in the countryside. It provided the basis for the subsequent development of industrial capitalism on lines closer to Western models. But we should recognize that corporate organization varies greatly between countries in terms of defined mutual responsibilities of different stakeholders, owners, shareholders, directors, managers, workers, wider communities. At one extreme, we have cooperative organizations owned by workers. At another, the limited liability company where shareholders have no responsibility responsibilities and directors are only responsible for making profits. The narrowness of these definitions in Anglo-Saxon, uh, Anglo-American capitalism produces the abuses of corporate power which lead to debacles like Enron and Lehman Brothers. The German model of Mitbestimmung lodges Mitverantwortung more effectively in a social market economy. These are national models of shared responsibility. And you might still say, OK, I accept that point, that there is, as it were, collective responsibility institutionalized in a country. But global responsibility? No global government. Can't be. Indeed, uh, many have said, look, as soon as you point to global, you avoid responsibility because there is no collective agency up there. Without a world government, we can't be collectively responsible. Well, I believe that argument is negated by the existence of multilateral institutions, global governance, global cooperation between nations, as the Duisburg Essen Katie Hamburger colleague will surely testify. Shared responsibility is no less responsibility, and Chancellor Merkel's affirmation of Mitverantwortung illustrates how that is effectively rendered in the German tongue. Minverantwortung alludes to norms underpinning a national commitment on which a constitution is based. It affirms the embeddedness of law in the normative order widely accepted as the basis of contemporary German politics. In the new German culture, in the new global culture, in centering individual and collective action on responsibility to the globe and in reinforcing the discourse of human rights, globality re-establishes norms as the premise of any possible legal system. It makes the normative, the new dynamic contribution to a re-examination of law in society, which Werner Gebhardt demanded in his comprehensive study of the relations of law to social theory. Globality asks us what contribution we can make to solving the challenges facing the globe. We can all, individually and in the multitude of collective entities to which we belong, including the nation state, assume global responsibility. And right at the end now, uh, I humbly allow myself to ask, what might be the specific <coughs> contribution of Germany? Now, I'm not going to venture an answer, I've asked the question, the answer is for German citizens. But let me conclude by drawing on the life experience of a, another British Germanophile, Lord Noel Annan, whose memoirs, My Age, no age, epoch, encourage me in the recognition that biography and the sense of passing epochs are closely interwoven. He was a, an academic in Cambridge before the Second World War. In the Second World War, he served with Winston Churchill in that underground bunker in the war rooms underground near Number 10 Downing Street, which you can visit if you, if you want to visit London as a tourist. 
those war rooms are open to inspect and you'll see the, the beds on which they lay at the time and Churchill's desk and so on. And Lord Annan served there. And then after the war, he came to Germany. He came to Germany as a military uh, person and he was part of the uh, British uh, High Commission Division here in Germany. He wrote um, his memoirs in this book, My Age. He accorded to 18th and 19th century German thought the title of the German Renaissance, as remarkable as the outburst of the creativity we call the Renaissance in Italy. For him, it was the recognition both of national culture and impersonal forces, which it was its great gift to the world. <coughs> And that meant they were eloquent champions of nationalism. Well, they were theoreticians of nationalism. The English practiced nationalism. The Germans theorized it. Who has the greatest guilt? Like the English before the World Wars, the world has been practicing collectivism without recognizing it. Indeed, recognition has been repressed. Hayek's strictures, they came on the back of the terrible experience of wars which made collectivism a dirty word. The time has come for those inhibitions to be thrown over. And I can think of no other intellectual tradition on which it is more suited to build a profound understanding of globality and the relations between individual and collective responsibility in the contemporary world than that German tradition, which includes Kant, Hegel, Marx, Weber, Luhmann, Habermas. What better foundation has any country got to address the issue of collective responsibility? Thank you very much.